So hello, welcome to Wildwood and welcome to our Raven Talk. We'll be telling you a little bit about the ravens here at Wildwood, so let's introduce them. We currently have two ravens and they're what's known as a true pair, so one male, one female. The male is called Ike. He hatched in 2010, so he's now 10 years old. The female is called Bina. She's a little bit older. She was hatched in 2005, so she's now 15 years old. If you're wondering, in the wild, ravens usually reach an age of sort of 15 to 20 years, but they are a long-lived species in captivity. Ages of up to 40 are fairly standard. Ravens belong to the crow family, known as the corvids, and they're the largest members of the crow family here in Britain. In appearance, they're very much like the crows themselves, but they are larger. To give you an idea of size, they're about as big as a buzzard or a mallard duck. Other ways that they're different from the crows, they have a more powerful, deeper beak. And one of the distinctive features is a beard of long feathers on the throat. Like various other birds, such as swans, penguins, and even albatrosses, Ravens tend to pair for life. As a rule, they tend to be solitary in the breeding season, but they're fairly sociable at other times of the year, particularly when there's plenty of food around. Ravens have been recorded calling to other ravens to let them know when there's a lot of food to share. It's also worth mentioning that uh, ravens are very vocal birds. They have a whole range of different sounds that they can make with different meanings. They're also surprisingly good mimics. They can even reproduce human speech rather like a parrot. In 2003, Vladimir Putin was visiting the Tower of London and he was very surprised when a raven called Thor said, good morning. And I actually used to know a raven called Jill who could say hello either in a bird type of voice or exactly like her original keeper. Ravens are widespread across the Northern Hemisphere. They don't just live wild in Britain. You can find them in Europe, Russia, and right the way across the continent of North America. They're one of only 20 bird species that live inside the Arctic Circle all year round. Most of those, like the snowy owl or the ptarmigan, have special features that help them survive in the extreme cold. Ravens don't. Ravens get by because of their diet and their intelligence. Ravens, well, in diet preference, they are omnivorous and opportunistic, which means they'll eat pretty much anything when they can. The bulk of their diet comes from scavenging, particularly from things like sheep and deer. And in the modern day, they'll be taking roadkill as well. Anything fairly meaty is good for them. And we know that on the coasts, They'll scavenge along the strand line and eat things like dead fish, crabs, and even sometimes seaweed. However, they don't just take meat. They'll eat things like birds' eggs, fruit, berries, and creepy crawlies. Ike and Beena have a very mixed diet. And they get everything from rabbit meat, chicken, hen's eggs, and fish. The other reason that they're so good at survival is down to their intelligence. It used to be a case that parrots were thought to be the cleverest of all birds. But the truth is, that's because they're bright and lively and they like showing off. It's now been realised that the crow family are far, far smarter. And it is suspected that ravens are the most intelligent of all living birds. They can solve problems in their heads without having to experiment. They can use tools and they have great memories and excellent recognition skills. In addition, it's fair to say that most crows, and ravens in particular, have real personalities. They're quite playful, even as adults in the wild. Ravens have been reported using snowbanks as slides and even using twigs as toys. One of the ravens at the Tower of London, called Merlin, has an unfortunate habit of playing dead in front of tourists. He'll literally flop on his side, stop breathing, and pretend to have actually dropped dead. Why? Because he finds it very, very funny to watch how people react. 
There used to be an old legend in North America that ravens would follow wolves. It's now been proved to be absolutely true. Ravens will follow wolves because they know sooner or later the wolves will make a kill and they'll be able to scavenge scraps from what's left over. It's also been proved that if ravens find a carcass and they can't break into it, they'll actually go and find the local wolves and guide them to the food. Ravens have been part of myth, legend and folklore for as long as there have been people around. A good example would be the word ravenous. It actually comes from an old belief that ravens had appetites that were totally insatiable and could never be sated. Over in America, the First Nations, in many of their legends, the raven is either a trickster or a creator. Probably the most famous ravens in myth come from Norse mythology, the legends of the Vikings. They were called Hugin and Munin, thought and memory, and they were the pets of Odin, king of the gods. Hugin and Munin would spend their days flying around the nine worlds, and then they'd fly back to Odin, they'd perch on his shoulders, and they'd whisper to him all that they had seen. In Wales, there's a particular legend that King Arthur, when he died, was transformed into a raven, and so killing ravens is bad luck. Probably the most famous British myth about the ravens is to do with the Tower of London. It is said that if the ravens ever leave the tower, then Britain will fall to its enemies. It used to be thought that this legend went back to medieval times, and it was claimed that Charles II had actually ordered the ravens to be looked after. However, more recent research suggests that is all a Victorian fabrication. It was in Victorian times that people started to really notice the ravens, and they became something of a tourist attraction. Today, there are seven ravens kept at the Tower of London. They have their own designated keeper, known as the Raven Master, and they're even part of a captive breeding programme. Perhaps the strangest things about the ravens at the Tower of London is that technically they are enlisted soldiers. To read the exact details, the Tower Ravens are enlisted as soldiers of the Kingdom, and they can be dismissed for unsatisfactory conduct. In 1986, George lost his appointment to the Crown for repeatedly attacking and destroying TV aerials. A special decree was issued about the incident, and it read as follows. On Saturday the 13th of September 1986, Raven George, enlisted 1975, was posted to the Welsh Mountain Zoo. Conduct and satisfactory, service therefore no longer required. You literally couldn't make this stuff up. In terms of history, crows are traditionally seen as unlucky birds or birds of ill omen. Partly that's because of their black colour and also they have a habit of turning up on battlefields to scavenge the bodies of the dead soldiers. Also, in Viking times, the raiders would quite often carry banners showing crows or ravens, so understandably they get associated with uh, bad events. Ravens, though, were slightly different. In the Middle Ages, they were very much urban birds. They lived in the towns and the cities, and they were appreciated. They were part of the clean-up crew. In the Middle Ages, there was very little idea of health or hygiene, and things that ended up being chucked into the street included rotten meat, dead animals, and even human waste. Ravens, red kites, and black kites were all scavengers who actually cleaned up this material. In Tudor times, if you killed crows, you'd get a reward. But if you tried to kill a raven, you'd get a fine. In the northern town of Berwick-upon-Tweed, in 1584, the fine for killing a raven was one crown. However, after Elizabethan times, cities started to clean up their act. The ravens lost their food source, they started to move back into the countryside. And there, they weren't seen as positively. There, they were seen as pests. By the 18th century, there were bounties for killing ravens, and this accelerated in Victorian times with the gamekeepers, who would kill 
any animal they saw as a potential threat to their pheasants, grouse and partridges. They would trap, shoot and poison animals such as foxes, crows, ravens and kites. By the mid 20th century, ravens have been driven back into wild remote parts of Wales, Scotland and Northern England. But there is good news. Today, now that they're no longer being persecuted, ravens are spreading back into their old territories. Just last year, we recorded the first wild raven here on site at Wildwood. Though it has to be said, Ike was very upset that there was another raven around. He started actually calling to try and scare it off. So it is nice to be able to say that with just a little bit of support, there's a very good chance we could see the ravens right across Britain and they could become once again a common sight in our skies. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing a little bit about these amazing birds and we hope you have a great time out when you visit here at Wildwood.